2022 meeting of the 1904 World's Fair Society. Most of you know I'm Mike Truex, and for those who don't, I'm Mike Truex. <laughs> it's so good to see so many people here. Uh, I'm sure someone will give me a head count from the back of the room like uh, Mr. Stone. This year is the 118th anniversary of the opening of the World's Fair, and it's the 36th anniversary of our society. I hope that everyone came, that came to our picnic has recovered from the sweltering sauna of June 12th. How many people went to the picnic? Did you all survive uh, with some cold beer and cold water? And that's good. Uh, tonight, we're gonna have a, a new presentation from Michael Loind about his new book he's written, centered on the 1904 Olympic games and an unexpected medal winner. He has recently authored a book about it, uh, this subject, which expands far beyond just the swimming events of 1904. We also have some attendance prizes that we'll be drawing for after this presentation. Has everybody put your, their name in the uh, big plastic box? Um, and I probably ought to put my name in there too. There's something for, you don't ask. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, we have a few copies of a book that was written in 2001 by Max Storm and several other Olympic people that photographs all of the medals and badges that the History Museum has in their files. We have a special little certificate called a golden ticket, scratch off ticket that has been donated from Mr. Jerry Miller. And this will entitle the winner to contact him to set up a home tour of him, his home and his collection of World's Fair memorabilia, which is quite extensive. And then donated from uh, Michael, Lo Michael Loind is a replica gold medal from the 1904 World's Fair. And it is made out of metal. It is. <laughs> it probably is not even gold plated though. <laughs> it's a nice shiny brass, I'm sure. Yeah. I wanna just show it to everybody online because we've taken pictures of it and you'll get to see it in the bulletin. And we also have uh, floating around in, oh, this will be the uh, uh, creme de la creme uh, of, uh, attendance prizes probably for this year and maybe the next decade. <laughs> and so that's our attendance prizes. Uh, first, I wanna ask if there's any new members or guests here or non-members, please raise your hand. And uh, if you're a friend of Michael Loind, Loind, you can raise both hands. <laughs> ah, there's our targets here and there. So folks uh, on the back table are some handouts like this that tell probably about 70 or 80 facts about the fair and just the stuff that you wouldn't know or remember other than it was in 1904. And we also have a membership form which is entitles you to a one year membership, but since it's July, you can join for $35 for this year and next year. And that will get you our monthly bulletin, uh, invitations to all of our meetings before everybody else on Zoom and stuff like that. And, uh, any special gifts or handouts. And we've been doing some nice ones, kind of like that uh, map you looked at, that aerial view. Mm -hmm. oh, that's great. We mailed out 260 of those a couple of years ago. And that turned into a, a fun challenge. So uh, do you want to just introduce yourself and say how you know Mike Loind or if you have any special interest or connection to the fair or one, two, three, four people? Real quick. I'm Mike's wife, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Carol Dolan. My husband brought the book home and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And I must admit, I told the gentleman at the door the section about um, the World's Fair. That in particular, I want to make sure that my sons read, well, they should read the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> but to make sure they at least read that part. You know, I always thought of it as significant to St. Louis's history, but the book really highlights how nationally and even globally, you know, how significant it was. So, and, um, so it was it was very well done. So yeah, your group should be very excited about it. That, that's a great uh, PR and tease for the book. Yeah. <laughs> Scott Dole and friend of Michael's for long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Well, I want to welcome you. And oh, one more. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I want to urge all of you to consider at least uh, becoming a member. Uh, normally, it's $25 per calendar year for the monthly bulletin, uh, coming to our meetings, free gifts now and then, and special attendance prices. 
And if you haven't signed up for these attendance prizes, please do. A uh, few quick administrative uh, reminders and announcements. Please be sure and silence your cell phones so that we don't have any ringing in the middle of this meeting. Uh, everybody signed up. Check our website regularly. The upgraded website is uh, evolving. Uh, you can now pay for your membership through the website, although you'd probably want to be talked through it. We haven't got that uh, uh, totally labeled and branded yet. Also check out the Society's Facebook group page. There are some postings about a few other events and presentations on there. Numerous pictures and facts about the World's Fair, and we have 5, 000, over 5,000 people on there, and no one's shy about asking questions or trying to answer questions too. Uh, and it has, uh, website has several years worth of pictures. We also have an Instagram page that Holly Childers maintains and uh, oh, probably twice a week or so, she's publishing new pictures about the fair that are very unusual. And you go, where is that? And she's gonna tell you about it when she posts it. Uh, I know we'd have one board member report. Uh, Doug Stone, you wanna come up here and tell people a little bit about the FARE, the St. Louis World's Fair? In September on uh, Labor Day, September 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, our association, our society is going to uh, sponsor a couple tents where we're going to tell the history of the World's Fair to people who come to Forest Park if you ever use the parking lot for the rest of this festival. festival has music and food and plenty of parking. It's all free. All well, food's not all free. But, but the music and the entertainment all is free. Come and enjoy. Uh, there's going to be a car show on Saturday and Sunday that's sponsored by the St. Louis Car Museum. Um, there's they just signed this great guy as the music for Friday night, but I can't for the life of me tell you that I've ever heard of him. He was described as being very ill, ill as in sick, as in good. Okay. The, the festival does not all have music that I'm familiar with. But it will be fun. And then there will be some right time and some other different groups that will be playing throughout the day. Anyway, it's fun. The, the other reason I'm talking about it is that I'm trying to sign members up to help out at the tent. So it's Friday and then Saturday and Sunday. It's 12 hours on Saturday and Sunday. So I don't want to do it by myself. It's not that much fun. But it's good. But, so anyway, help out the camp. I'll have a sheet back here at the end of the meeting. Okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, it's a really fun thing to go do for a few hours on Labor Day weekend. You get to meet other members and talk with them. You'll learn about some of the memorabilia. And before you know it, just like that, you'll be like Veneva Grimes, who can tell people all about the fair and all the memorabilia that they're looking at. That's right. <laughs> She's already signed up. Ah, uh -huh. um, let's see. Uh, I also want to tell people briefly about a couple of new items that we have, uh, and you'll be able to obtain these at the FARE. Unfortunately, we cannot sell items here at a meeting like this, although I don't know if Left Bank Books is uh, show there back in the back corner with uh, some of the books for sale. How much are the books? 33.25. Okay, 33 something, including tax. Uh, for a book that... Uh, uh, could you bring uh, my copy, or do you have a copy to show people real quick and hold up? Um, it's on its way up here. And while it's on its way up here, um, I want to tell people about some new merchandise items. We have some note cards that have been recently made. They premiered at our uh, picnic. And there's a set of six different cards. And uh, Nan really likes this one because it's got both the train and the Ferris wheel on it. And it's they're blank on the inside so they can be used for anything. And also, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but something we've had in the past for a long time. Uh, I guess it's not gonna focus that close, but World's Fair Society pens that have been pretty reliable in the month or so I've been using. So those will be available uh, at meetings where we can sell things. And here's a picture of the Waterman, which of course was advertised with the uh, PR for this. So I wanna set up this stage uh, with this presentation with some information about what happened 118 years ago at the St. Louis World's Fair. Thursday, July 14th was a warm, sunny day. The fair was in full swing after 10 weeks, uh, opening 10 weeks ago. The buildings were all complete. The exhibits were all set up and everything on the pike was open. So uh, 
in an interview at La Harve, uh, aeronaut Alberto Santos Dumont, a Frenchman, uh, who had brought his dirigible to the fair and was anticipated he would fly it well because he had flown it for a mile or two uh, in Paris, including circling the Eiffel Tower. He failed to fly his airship in St. Louis because it was somehow damaged. He said he had no intention of returning to St. Louis. The chief of the exposition police believed that he either slashed his own airship or he hired someone to do it, claiming sabotage. He now said he never planned to fly the airship. He just wanted to exhibit his dirigible and charge admission. On the plaza, the Sioux, Apache, Pawnee, and other Indian tribes performed ceremonial dances to entertain a large crowd. The crowd included the Ainus from Japan, the Patagonians from Argentina, South America, and Pygmies from Africa. Geronimo was not able to attend because he was a federal prisoner and he was not allowed to wear his native garb. The dances were meant to honor the second regiment of the Illinois National Guard, but they didn't show up. Nonetheless, the large crowd enjoyed the performances. And how many people know what July 14th is to other people in other countries? Bastille, Bastille Day. The French celebrated Bastille Day at their replica of the Grand Trianon at Versailles. Dr. Alexander de Manil read the names of the Frenchmen who had helped found the city of St. Louis, noting that they would never be forgotten. Many of their names had marked the streets and parks of St. Louis. And now it's time for our presentation. We'll get the uh, front lights turned off maybe and be sure and stay for the attendance prize drawings. Uh, I gotta go put my name in the box uh, following the presentation because Michael and uh, Jerry will draw names out of, the, out of our boxes. Michael Loind is a St. Louis sports attorney and lecturer. He's chairman of the St. Louis Olympic Committee and is a member of the International Society of Olympic Historians. His new book is titled, The Watermen, The Birth of American Swimming and One Young Man's Fight to Capture Olympic Gold. And the book covers all of that. Now, Michael and the St. Louis Olympic Committee were involved quite a bit with the effort, what, about three years ago mm -hmm. to get okay. Francis Field and Francis Gymnasium renamed. Mm -hmm. It is now David R. Francis Olympic Field and uh, David R. Francis uh, Gymnasium. Or that's, that's not true. But not quite. Yeah. <laughs> But we, we did rename the stadium, the yes. Olympic Stadium. And it's it's actually one of only a few that have that name, which is really cool. Um, so we had to go through all these IOC hoops. And then we got the Olympic rings there, which is a nice- Yes. Program. And if you haven't seen the Olympic rings right next to the stadium, it's worth a drive. You don't have to go in and park anywhere. There's a few free parking spots mm -hmm. there. The rings are extremely impressive. Thank you. Uh, they're, each ring is what, about six feet in diameter? They're something huge. Like that. Yeah, they're, 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 they're huge. They all have a picture of us at the big rings. Oh, I yeah. love it. <laughs> yeah. That's great. How many other cities have the rings? Uh, well, most current Olympic cities do. Um, again, our Olympics, the, the rings weren't drawn out until I think it was 1913, something like that. And uh, so we had to retroactive, uh, we had to, we approached the IOC to literally have them start a legacy program that would allow us to get the rings because any other city that has them, they were done during the Olympics in that city at that time. And each city is allowed two. So we have one um, right now. And we've been, we, there's a couple of sites we'd like to put the second one, but we'll see. Ah. Interesting uh, news. We'll start urban legends all over yeah, the place. Right. Um, but I've read uh, a good bit of the book, particularly the St. Louis chapters and beforehand about Charles Daniels. And with that, I'm going to trade seats with you and uh, move on back and uh, bring up PowerPoint. And uh, let's see, I need to go into screen sharing. and get PowerPoint, share, and then go full screen. David, how am I doing? 
There. Okay. What do I do to move this slide? Um, just hit the left button. Okay. You can. <laughs> or you can scroll with someone. All right. Let's let's see if this. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for having me here. It's uh, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, this uh, what I'm going to talk about tonight is. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the 1904 Olympics and what happened here in St. Louis. Uh, so to give you some background, so this is, I love this story. I, I love it because it's a story about hope and empowerment. And ultimately, I love it because it's really a story about America, not only the birth of swimming, but about America itself. And it's told through a boy whose name is Charles Daniels. And he was undersized. He was anxiety ridden. He was, he was about to probably have some of the worst things that could ever happen to a boy his age. Uh, and he was going, determined to survive them. Now, this is during the Gilded Age. It's at the end of the Gilded Age. And it's a time when England and Victorianism really had a tight squeeze around the American upper class and our society itself. And America was still trying to figure out what we wanted to be as a nation. Uh, we were not yet on the world stage. Again, England's culture still kind of dominated us. Uh, and again, we were trying to figure out what it is to be an American. And swimming, I'm gonna, let's see, click on this. So this boy, Charles Daniels, was trying to figure out who he was as a person. When he was younger, his father thought he was worthless. And he was trying to prove that he, was, he had value. So at the time, again, it was the Gilded Age, Nobody swam here in America. So imagine that. Turn of the century, 1900, nobody really swam. You see, I, I took this picture, and if you see, there's ropes going out into the ocean. And these were common. And what people would do is they'd hold on just so they could wade into the water and get wet because they couldn't swim. <laughs> and, and if you look, a lot of people, when you came down to the beach, you'd show up in your Sunday best. At the time, it wasn't couth to get a tan. You'd want to pale was the in thing, as close to death as possible, if preferred. <laughs> and the women were especially <laughs> handicapped because they had to wear swimming outfits that had about 17 yards of fabric on them. And they were designed to basically cover every part of your flesh and not at all designed for swimming in mind. So it was a very interesting time. And again, a lot of that was Victorianism at its best and uh, Puritanism here at America. But uh, so again, nobody really swam. The few swimming pools there were, and there were only really about a dozen or so pools in the entire country. They were typically confined to elite athletic clubs. Uh, they were, and again, unless you had a lot of money, you really didn't have access to swimming pools. And if you look at it, they were typically in a basement, not exactly picturesque. They, they didn't have any gutters or lane lines. There was no lines at the bottom of the pool. They didn't have chlorine. The water was usually some shade of brown. If you wanted to clean it, you literally had to drain it, scrub it down, and then fill it back up, which wasn't exactly the easiest thing to do. So it didn't happen all that often. They didn't have goggles. If you, if you swam as a male, uh, a lot of times you either swam naked or you swam with a wool swimming suit. And uh, again, wasn't all that conducive for uh, swimming. And pools typically had no set size. Uh, they were put in a basement and whatever length the basement allowed, that was it. So the longest swimming pool you got at that time was about 25 to 30 yards. And some even averaged only about 20 yards, which the current Olympic pool is 50 meters. So a uh, big difference back then. So swimming, again, 
it was also the dawn of sports in the Olympics. Now the Olympics started in 1896 and they were in Athens. Nobody was very excited about these Olympics. It was kind of odd. Uh, international competition was extremely strange. If you think about it, there wasn't any committees set in place to raise money for these athletes. Travel was very expensive, not only very time consuming, it would take you a month to travel there and back typically. A lot of people could not take off work during that time unless you were wealthy. So international competition was odd. And swimming in the, at Athens, as you can see, is in, a, is in an ocean. And it was freezing. Uh, most of the swimmers suffered from hypothermia afterwards. Or if, and they, one, the swimmer who won said it became less about swimming and more about just living, <laughs> try, <laughs> trying to get to the uh, shore and survive. The, the next Olympics was in Paris, and they swam in the River Sin, which, um, again, they just didn't have pools or access to them. The Paris Olympics were a complete disaster. In fact, after them, Cooper Tan said there was nothing Olympic about them, and he thought the Olympics was, everybody thought it was on, on life support. The goal, he, Cooper Tan wanted it to go to England because they were the most powerful sports uh, empire in the world. Sports started with them. Uh, it was very much a part of their culture. They boasted about having the best athletes and everything. And he wanted it to go to, he wanted the next Olympics to go to England to hopefully keep them alive. Well, England said, you know, why do we want to listen to a Frenchman? We're, we're the best sports nation in the world. So if you want to compete against us, come to our championships. You know, there's no reason why we need to travel anywhere, or go to these silly games. So nobody wanted them except the United States. And as you know, Chicago was very much interested in them and Chicago was awarded them. Yet somehow they ended up in St. Louis, which we're gonna talk about. So Charles Daniels at the time wanted to be a swimmer. Now, why would anybody in this country want to be a swimmer? Nobody did it. If you were a boy, Typically, football, track and field, crew, those were the big things. Uh, swimming, just nobody did, and it really wasn't heard of. Yet, he wanted to be a swimmer. Why? Well, it goes back to his parents. His parents came from very high society in Buffalo. And if you know anything about Buffalo, uh, it's, it's on the Erie Canal, and it became one of the wealthiest communities in our country at the end of the 19th century. They had a row called Millionaire's Row, and there were presidents who lived on that row. Mark Twain lived on it at one point, um, and that's where his parents grew up. His one grandfather was the uh, New York Supreme Court Justice, very well revered. He was a congressman. He started the Buffalo Law School. His other grandfather owned the biggest department store in Buffalo, so a very wealthy family. And his father, so Charles was suffering from anxiety. And his father was a very demanding individual. He was a narcissist. And Charles was only supposed to be a reflection of him. So when he, Charles couldn't compete in sports and he couldn't socialize because he was so anxiety ridden and probably stuttered pretty badly. Uh, his father took him one day when he was 11 years old to a swimming pool. It was one of the few pools that you can pay to get in. And he basically threw him in and said, swim. And Charles Daniels almost drowned. It said he swallowed enough water to sink a warship. And he was so traumatized, he wanted nothing to do with the water. So again, so why does he want to become a swimmer later on? Well, his father uh, was also a philanderer and he walked out on Charles and his mother when he was 14 years old. Uh, the father then, his mother and he, in a time in society when women especially of her social class, didn't work. Um, it was kind of taboo for them to work. You didn't have entry into the social life unless you had a husband. So they put a facade on that they were still very much married and he was living with them, but they, uh, he wasn't, not at all. In fact, he completely disowned him and didn't give him a penny. And she had a little bit of inheritance from her father that was still left that they were get, just getting by. What happens? Why does Charles want to be a swimmer? Well, he, he sees it kind of as a way to connect with his father. Now, 
anxiety back then, we didn't really have a lot of knowledge on how to cure it. There wasn't really drugs you could take or a psychiatrist to visit. The, they called it nervousness because they didn't want to associate it with mental illness. Mental illness back then, you were put into a uh, what they called a nut house or something like that and never seen from again. So it was called nervousness. And some of the things that they'd give you were, you know, morphine, cocaine to try to, to try to cure it, not exactly the greatest things in the world. The other thing, if you were a woman and you had it, you were, you were told to lay in bed and then that will, that will cure it. You're too, too excited. And if you were a man, you were told to go to the outdoors and if you had money to rope cattle and go out west and, and do manly things, which is actually what Teddy Roosevelt did. And he suffered from anxiety and, and did, did the same thing. So for Charles, who didn't, uh, wasn't an athlete or anything like that, his father, who actually could swim, he taught himself on Lake Erie, threw him in the pool and again, traumatized him. But Charles kind of saw swimming as a way to prove himself to his father. He said, I, I want to, thought to himself, I want to be a good swimmer. And so he went about it. But unfortunately, he was, he got into the New York Athletic Club at a very, he was a teenager. Nobody still thought much about him. One person stood up and said, look, let this kid in, I'll give him a chance to swim, give him a chance to prove himself. And he still couldn't win a race. So he was on the cusp of being cut from the New York Athletic Club when his father reappears in his life. In all the newspapers, unfortunately, his father is basically the Bernie Madoff of the day. He is running a wall, one of the biggest Wall Street swindling rings at the time. And they are thrown out of society. It is horrible for them. And now the only place Charles has to go, his mom and he are totally ostracized, is this New York Athletic Club basement. Because Swimmers back then, again, they were misfits. They were oddballs. Uh, people who gravitated to swimming, a lot of them uh, were suffered some kind of disability, typically a leg disability brought about by polio or something like that. They were immigrants, immigrants who could not get into the club anywhere else. Um, but they were good swimmers and they were good athletes. So the club allowed them to be swimmers in their basement and, and be good, uh, represent the club well. So Charles kind of flew under the radar, but he was constantly worried that the members of the club or anybody would find out his association with his father. Uh, so again, it gets to winter. It's winter of 1903. What's coming up is the Olympics. Now again, St. Louis has since stolen the Olympics from Chicago. Well, did they really steal them? Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> they did. We had all the money. We had, everybody was coming to the World's Fair. Uh, at the time, 60 to 70% of the United States was rural. So they did, there was not a radio, there was not a TV. Uh, newspapers still really weren't national yet. So the World's Fairs were the one way to collaborate and show all these wonderful things and ideas going on with the world. So people were gonna come to St. Louis. And what happened was Chicago had them, but uh, David Francis said, look, we have all the money. We have all the people coming here. And guess what? The Amateur Athletic Union has already committed to having their championships here. And all their athletes are going to compete here. And none are going to be at the Olympics. So what are you going to do? And Chicago said, OK, you have us. You can have the Olympics. So and again, at the time, they weren't really a big deal. But I think David Francis kind of saw the potential of what they could be internationally, as did James Sullivan at the time who was in charge of the AAU. So they ended up in St. Louis. Now, Charles Daniels, it is December of 1903. He is three months from being kicked out of the New York Athletic Club and never having a chance to, to make a name of himself. And it's Christmas time and he doesn't have a lot to be merry about. So he goes to the club and swims. And the only other person there is a uh, Jewish immigrant named Otto Wally who swam in the 1900 Olympics. And he decides to teach Charles the proper way to do what was called the trudging stroke. It was the, then the fastest racing stroke at the time. So Charles ends up setting a couple American records leading up to the Olympics. And he gets asked to be a part of the New York Athletic Club team that goes to the Olympics. So we're gonna, let's see, am I doing this right? Oops, hold on a second. 
I have some more. There we go. So this is an article. So the Olympics at the time, again, no radio, no TV. So this was the first time America was really going to be able to see the Olympics and be introduced to them. And they appeared in all the big papers. They did big spreads on them. And people were starting to get interested in what are these Olympics about? And particularly, swimming became a part of the American fabric out of a tragedy. It was the worst thing to happen in New York, the worst tragedy to happen in New York um, until 9-11. It was called the General Slocum accident. And for those, uh, if anybody knows what happened, it was a pleasure cruise steamship and it was filled with women and children who were going for a Sunday picnic and it caught fire and none of them could swim. So they tried to take the ship and, and dock it at the closest island they could it's catching on flames all over the place. Women and children had to either stay in there and hit, get hit by the flames or jump in the water and not be able to swim. They were, all they had to do was float for maybe a couple minutes or be able to swim maybe 50 meters to shore. None of them could. And over 1,100 people died that day. And it terrified the United States. And so there was a cry that people should start to learn how to swim, particularly women and children. Um, they said, even though women still had to wear dresses. So figure that one out. Uh, so anyway, so the Olympics swimming becomes interesting. Before then, their national championships, barely 100 people would show up. And they were mostly friends and family. At these Olympics, about 8,000 people showed up. They were at the life-saving lake, which you could see is, is was at Y down in Skinker. Uh, it was right by the big Ferris wheel. And the course was 110 yards. And the finish line was actually, well, one end at least, was a rope. And there was just a barrel attached to it. So it floats. So unlike today where you could go pivot off a wall and then start back, you had to grab the rope, touch it, and then swim away. So uh, there was a lot more to do for a swimmer uh, than just swim. And you can see they used a wooden dock back then. Uh, it was, you could see it bowed because there were so many people on it. It was, it was propped up by barrels, floating barrels. And that, that's how they swam. So the 1904 Olympics, England had no intention of coming to St. Louis. Again, they were the most powerful sports country. They said, nah, we're not going to St. Louis. A few other, few other athletes did on their own dime. Uh, their swimmers had no intention of swimming us because we were awful. We were a laughing stock. The United States had the worst swimming program uh, amongst U uh, Europe or anybody else. Um, and so they didn't come. But one swimmer, Germany and Austria showed up. And so the swimmers were trying to beat Germany and Austria. And one particular Austrian who's at the end here, you could see him at the far end. His name was Zoltan Halme. And he had the record for the 100 yard. Uh, what they called the century swim. And that was considered the fastest swim. So Charles Daniels is called to go up against him. Somebody in America has to beat them. We can't get shown up by the Europeans on our own uh, waters. So the race goes off. Everybody jumps in. Charles Daniels finds himself at the lead. He's winning, he's winning, he's winning. And then in the last minute, the Zoltan Dahame bursts forward with a splash. And what was so significant about that, it was the first time that the United States, any of us had ever seen the crawl stroke, which was today had evolved into the freestyle stroke. So Charles Daniels, again, he loses. He wins three gold medals here um, and then a bronze and a silver. But the British didn't show up. But what he does do is he breaks one of the British world records. And the Brits say, no way did you do that. They don't believe him. So they discount it. So it doesn't get in. So he decides to go over to England. And what happens over the next four years is one of the most incredible underdog stories in our nation's sports history. And if you want to find out, you're going to have to read the book. <laughs> but he, But I will tell you one thing about him. When he finally retired 
it was just shy of the 1912 Olympics. He was at the top of the game and everybody wanted him to swim. And he didn't because he wanted the next He He spent many years traveling around the country. He didn't make any money. Just he wanted people to swim and he wanted to teach them the freestyle stroke that we now all swim that he invented. And, and he said, look, if I go over to the 1912 Olympics, it's all going to be on me. And I, I'm not, that's not who I am. America has to stand up for themselves. So that's what he did. He rode off into the sunset. He was a very humble person, very shy person. And that's why I think his story kind of got lost in history. But what he did was he started U.S. swimming. He started our entire culture of swimming. He kicked off what is the greatest dynasty in Olympic sports. The United States swimming has more Olympic gold medals than the next 11 countries combined. Wow. And to show you what, Char and Charles Daniels during his career, which wasn't too long, about eight years, he won more Olympic swimming medals than anyone until Mark Spitz finally beat it in 1972. Mm -hmm. So his story is an amazing story. His dad comes back into the picture numerous times, very damaging to Charles. But uh, again, it's a story of hope. It's a, it's a wonderful story of just empowerment. And it's a great story of America. So I hope you get a chance to enjoy it and read it. And I had so much fun writing it and so much fun just talking about the 1904 Olympics in St. Louis and this. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take a few. That would be great. Yes. Is your book available on Kindle? It is. Yes. And Audible and everything. But <laughs> Left Banks Books is here today. So if you get a chance to, to get the actual hardcover, I'd, I'd love to sign it and put a little note for you. Um, One of the people that we've heard about in the athletic side of the 1904 Olympics was uh, the individual with the wooden leg. Yes. And I was just wondering how you would rate his medal winning efforts with that. Was that a handicap or do you think that was a thing that helped him say against Charles Daniels? Uh, well, so that was uh, George Eisner, who yes. is who is amazing. Um, and he was the first uh, person with a disability to medal at the Olympics. He won, I believe it's five medals. Uh, he, was an, he was an amazing gymnast uh, and had a wooden leg. He had a wooden leg. So you think about trying to dismount with a wooden leg on a few of those things. It's not an easy thing to do. And it wasn't because, you know, some people say, well, not a lot of the foreigners showed up to the St. Louis Olympics, but he went with a gymnast team to the, I think it was Germany or Austrian world championships. And that team took, I think, first or second place. And George played a big part in that. So he was a wonderful athlete, but he didn't do for his sport what Charles Daniels did. You know, Charles Daniels really created U.S. swimming here in the United States and invented the freestyle stroke and really became a role model for kids who never knew swimming was even a competitive sport here and began swimming because of him. And probably he saved a lot of lives because of it, because people wanted to learn how to swim now. And one other interesting fact, too, because of the freestyle stroke, it broke ground for women as far as fashion, because they could no longer swim in dresses. And there was a woman called Annette Kellerman from Australia who refused to swim in dresses, and she swim in men's outfits. And you'll read about this in the book, too. And she was a big advocate for uh, women shedding the dresses and wearing swimsuits that you actually could swim in. And that broke down the door for women, not only in fashion, but it broke down the door for women in sports. Because swimming, if you look at pictures of the 1904 Olympics, the women, it's golf, right? Archery mm -hmm. and tennis, right? And they're in big gowns and big hats. Now you try any, none of us want to play in that. But because they didn't want to, society was such that women couldn't sweat. They didn't want to see women sweat. And swimming, because you didn't see women sweat when they swam, opened the door for those kind of athletic sports and then ultimately kicked down the door for track and field and everything else. So again, 
swimming was was a big part of our culture and becoming who we were as a society, as America. It put us up against the British, kind of finally put us on the same table with them. And uh, again, it's just a great story of America. So I hope everybody gets a chance to read it. And thank you very much There's for inviting me. Some more questions going. Yeah, I need to uh, stop the share so that we can. Uh, okay see the chat room and maybe some questions, but I have another uh, question for you about life-saving lake. Does that, that work for you, David, so you can see the yeah. chat now? Okay. Um, oh, you're, that's because you can't. Okay. Um, life-saving lake had a rep, bad reputation from what I've read in some sources. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there's, Olympic pitfalls and pratfalls or bad reputation from Life Saving Lake that alleged that because you know there were cows around mm -hmm. and all the stuff yep. that was in it, that uh, entire teams and swim teams, et cetera, got sick a few weeks later or a month later or whatever. What's your take on that? Uh, my take is actually in the book. <laughs> uh, and you can find out exactly the truth behind all that. Okay. <laughs> uh, no gimmies, huh? <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I'll let you do one other tease uh, in the preface or introduction. Yeah. Was that at the 1908 Olympics? The night, yeah, the 1908 Olympics. So, if you do read this, it, it's in the first couple of pages of the book. So I'm not spoiling, spoiling much. But Charles Daniels in 1908 went to the London Olympics. So Britain finally said, okay. We're going to have them. We're going to make them the biggest ever. And there's no way we're going to let the swimmer beat us on our own soil. And he was notorious for making these amazing turns off the wall. And that, that's why they said he was able to beat them in the 100 meters. And they built a pool 100 meters long so he couldn't turn. And not only that, but to make absolutely certain he did not win, let alone set a world record on British soil because they currently held the world record. They told in the gold medal round, now England didn't use a, a starting pistol. They said, on your mark, take your marks. Are you ready? Go. That's how they started all their cadence. Well, in the gold medal round, they told everybody but Charles Daniels, we're changing the cadence. We're going to say, on your marks, go. And he was taking off his robe when they said go. He was still at his robe around him. So you got to find out what happens. <laughs> yes. Did his father ever accept him after all of his disputes? Or did he do any kind of relationship with his family? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And the answer is in the book. <laughs> it's, you know, that story and the two stories that I loved, uh, there was a couple of stories, but the relationship with him and his father was just heartbreaking, um, but it plays out. It does play out. And the relationship with him and his mother and what they had to go through. Um, it, it, you know, they really had to hold hands and, and go through a wall that nobody else had done before. And uh, I, I think you'll, and that plays out too. And that's, again, it's, it's a very hopeful book. So I, I hope you read it. Yes. Why, why did you write this book and how did you do research on this book? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, so I came across this during when we were getting the Olympic rings here because we wanted to, I, I wanted to dive deep and find out all the history of the St. Louis Olympics because there's a lot of history out there that's not true. There's a lot of stories out there that are inaccurate, misplaced, and because they're just kind of funny gags that get repeated and repeated and repeated. So we wanted to dispel that. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't unearthing something that would offend people too. Um, so uh, that's what we did. And I, I went to research some Olympians and I uncovered his story. And I thought, wow, this guy won five medals here. And one of them was the first gold medal ever won by a United States swimmer. And I dug a little deeper and I said, gosh, this guy invented the freestyle stroke. Like, Went, invented the freestyle stroke. I thought they'd been around forever. And then I found out just how bad American swimming was and what it was at that point. And I thought, this is a really good article. Um, 
but then when I found out the story of his father and other things going on in his life, and it had every, I love underdog stories. My wife will tell you, I'll be in tears at, at the end of them. I'll, and I can watch them 50 times and I'll still be in tears at the exact same spot. You know, Hoosiers, Rudy, Secretariat, you name it. I'm, I'm in. Um, it checked all those boxes and I just fell in love with the story and I had to write it. And, and the research, um, it was very extensive. Uh, one of the last things I had, because it was also during COVID when I was researching this. Uh, and you, a lot of the places I went to in person before COVID, but during COVID, one of the great couple of you have those aha moments when you're like, okay, I could, this will be a great story. Uh, one was I was able to uncover the divorce file of the Daniels and of his parents. And that was sealed by the state of New York for a hundred years. So this story, you couldn't even tell it in, until the last decade, because that's when it became available. Um, one of the other aha moments was I, to flesh out all the characters around him, I wanted to get in the archives of the International Swimming Hall of Fame and it was closed all during COVID. And I kept bothering them every couple of months. Are you open yet? Are you open yet? Are you open yet? Are you open yet? Finally, I got a call from the uh, head of the International Swimming Hall of Fame. He's like, all right, I hear you've been very persistent. Um, uh, I'll, I'll open it up next week if you can come down here. And I said, I'll be there Monday. <laughs> So he showed me all the archives. I was there for three days and was able to get some great files on, on all the people around him. But one of the biggest research things was his, he has two granddaughters that are still alive. Uh, one lives in California and one, one lives in Wisconsin. And I wrote letters to them and they responded. And they said, well, why don't you come visit us? We might have a few things of this. I said, okay. So I went there and I visited with them and it was maybe about 30 minutes in and I, I I, I love them and I hope they like me enough. And she said, you know, sit here, wait a second. She got up from her chair and she walked in the back room and she came out with these two giant scrapbooks. And she goes, his mother made these. And my sister has the other half of this. So um, I was able to go through all those and uh, see his actual medals that he won. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was great. So those are the three big uh, research things that were just wonderful. But well, that yeah. was going to be my question. Do they have medals? They do. They do. Not all of them because he sold, they have his key Olympic ones, but they, he sold a lot of them just to make ends meet. He sold a lot of his trophies. Mm. Again, he, he lived very simply at the end of his life. Yeah. So, yes. Can you tell us how he passed away? No, 1973. <laughs> 1973. So he watched Mark Spitz break his record on TV. Yeah. On TV. Did I think they he, ever meet? No, they did not. They did, they did not. And then he died within the next year. So that was, that was a cool moment for him. The daughter said that was a big deal. Mike, yes. there was a question that popped up on the screen. People were wondering where they could buy autographed copies. Uh, Left Bank Books has autographed copies of, of the book. And if anybody buys them here, like I said, I'm happy to sign them and write a little note or what have you. So that'd be great. Yes. Um, okay, so that's true. That's true. Well, so Washington University is the only college campus that had um, track and field and the, the bulk of the Olympic Games on it. Um, Georgia Tech had some of the swimmings when it was in Atlanta. Um, and I think they have the rings. If you go to the Georgia Tech swimming facility, they have the rings on the wall. But as far as the actual Olympic ring sculpture, which they call a spectacular, I am not aware of any other school or university in the world that has those rings. Um, and Washington University Stadium is the oldest modern day active Olympic stadium in the world. Um, the first stadium at Athens is still ongoing, but it wasn't a modern stadium. They, it was an ancient stadium that they redid. And if you ever see it, it's very narrow. You would not want to run on that track. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's, it's a proud thing that WashU has those rings. It's great. But as getting back to Glen Echo, um, they're not officially sanctioned by the IOC <laughs> to, dis, to display the, uh, 
the Olympic rings there, but they do and I'm happy for them. And we're, we're trying to rectify that, which, which we will. Why is the IOC so close hold about the term Olympic and or displaying the flag and or the rings? Um, well, that's, that's a good question probably to ask them, but um, you know, I, 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 it, I look, it's, it's the most recognized trademark emblem in the world. It really is next to probably Coca-Cola, <laughs> but they big money to put right. the sign official it, sponsor. It, it is. So, so they're very protective of, of the rings and the logo and everything like that. Uh, so that's, that's, that's why, <laughs> that's why. Any other questions? Great. We have one from Zoom. Yes. So it's a pretty simple one. Which swimmer was Charles on the boards? Was he the littlest guy second to one right? Uh, he was, I think he was right next to Zoltan Halme. I'm not, well, let me see. We're going to find out. Oh, right here. Here we go. He was second. Yeah. If you, for, I'm looking at the left. Oops. Uh, oops. Yeah. <laughs> okay, That's there's it. only 18 slides here. Yeah. He he was the one next to Zoltan Halme at the far, far side, upper side, the far upper side. Screen sharing has stopped as the as the best is closed. And yeah, we had one last picture. Oh, yeah, can you just click on that one right there? I wonder if we can get that up. So the, here's a picture of him. Uh, yeah, in about 1906, 1907. Yeah, he was a good-looking guy. Yeah, he, he was he was a good-looking guy, and uh, and again, very humble and very shy, but uh, an incredible athlete. So, yes. Well, it's interesting, you know, with you being here tonight and the you know the overlap with the World's Fair. I'm curious as to how you're getting this story out to the swimming community because I think they would find it fascinating. You know, yeah. because you know when you hear the conditions that it makes people were swimming in and just the lack of swimming, you know, whether it's the parents or for the younger swimmers, how are you getting this? Yeah, so it's it's yeah, it's been covered on all the major swimming sites. And when I did the research, you know, I, I was lucky enough to, I actually talked to Mark Spitz and, and Rowdy Gaines and all these, uh, Matt Biondi, all these great, great swimmers uh, who were excited to share their stories and what it's like to swim at that high level. Um, Mark Spitz, who broke his record actually, back then he still swam without goggles. So um, that was kind of an interesting perspective. And all these swimmers talk about a piano dropping on their back uh, about 10 meters to 20 meters away from the wall. And it happens because you're going so hard, so fast. And I'm not talking distance ones, but short sprints and you're not really breathing like you need to. I mean, your legs are huge, powerful muscles and that's what you're using and your arms and everything like that. So they say your body just goes absolutely numb and you just got to will yourself to get to the end. Um, so anyway, uh, so yeah, so it's it's been covered in all those and uh, it, it's it's gotten great reception from them. So it's, it's terrific. Thank you. Well, thank you for getting the rings to wear shoes. You're welcome. It was, <laughs> we were very excited to do that. Yeah. And it was it was a group effort, but uh, it was uh, long overdue, right? Long overdue. So I'm, I'm happy to have, that we have something to mark the Olympics here. All right. Okay. Oh, okay. Last question. Yeah. Could the speaker expand on Charles' Adirondack connection? Ah, uh, yeah. So, so the Adirondacks were actually a really special place for him. Again, anxiety back then, they told you to go to the wilderness or, you know, get in the outdoors. And Teddy Roosevelt was a big advocate for that. So Teddy Roosevelt became president after the assassination at the 1901 Buffalo World's Fair. Uh, of President McKinley, uh, and he was a big act, uh, outdoors guy. Uh, he suffered from depression as well and anxiety, and the outdoors saved him. So Charles's mom knew about this, and she was trying to save her son. So she took him out to the Adirondacks, and the Adirondacks back then, 
again, they were, it was the Gilded Age and they, they must have been an incredible place back then. Uh, but he went there and that's really where he got comfortable with swimming. Uh, he was a, a scout. He was in one of the first Boy Scout groups, uh, although they weren't called the Boy Scouts back then. But um, And the book talks about that. And the Adirondacks is really where he would go just to find his peace. And it was his happy place. And he would go to practice swimming there before the Olympics and everything like that. And uh, again, his mom played a big part in that. So, uh, so that was his tie to the Adirondacks. But you could almost say the freestyle was invented in the Adirondacks. So uh, neat place. I have one other question, having read about some of the Olympic rivalries between the organizations back in 1904, et cetera. And also I came across a monument in Forest Park that's very hidden to, I think it's Friedrich Jan, it is. It is. Uh, who was one Jan. of the founders yeah. of the Turnverine or the Turners mm -hmm. that were very big in St. Louis. Yes. And what they went through to try to match up the AAU and the Turner schedules and the mm -hmm. Olympics. Uh, I'm surprised that Germany didn't have any impact in swimming or were the Turners dedicated more to just quote athletics. Yeah, uh, and more from the gymnastics capacity too. Okay. But the reason why we have that statue here is because when you think about it, when the big German immigration came over to the United States, it was Cincinnati and it was St. Louis. And the, the Turnverein societies were basically just social societies for the Germans. And, and that's how they, they were, the, I think the second, first one established in Cincinnati, the second one was established in St. Louis, but St. Louis had the strongest Turnverein society in the country at the time. And they wanted to honor the founder of the Turnverein's, which was this uh, John uh, individual. So that's why we have the only statue of him in the United States right now. But it's tucked away in Forest Park behind the uh, Boathouse Lake. So, but you can find it the boathouse? by the boathouse uh, across the, it's along that lake. If you're walking from the boathouse and I am more kind of towards the zoo, if you're, if you're walking towards where the Grand Basin is, there's a path that goes along and it's on your left-hand side. Below the art museum. And isn't that where the German pavilion stood at the fair? It's right over there. It's on the south side. Yeah. It's yeah. where the... That's it. It's where, it's where the German pavilion stood at the fair. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. That's, I believe that's correct. Um, okay. Okay. Um, before we get into the... Yeah. Uh, the uh, Thank you. We have some business to take care of. If you meet me over on this side. Yeah. <laughs> <without tripping. laughs> sure. Okay, um, you can come over here yep. and we're gonna pull five names out of this. This has names from three meetings this year. This is the third one. Okay. So there may be some names that we'll draw with uh, nobody there, but you can just start drawing and calling out people's names because we got five books to read. Okay. So that you sounds got about a one in, I don't know, six or seven chance of reading a free book. Okay. So first one is Mark Osborne. Is he here? Mark's not here. Okay. Is he on Zoom? His good friend is. Zoom doesn't count. Got to be in person. Okay. Second one is Bill Damer. Damer. Nope. Okay. I'm 0 for 2 here. Uh, let's see. Doug Stone. There we go, Doug. <laughs> And you get to stay up here for the photo. Right. Uh, why don't we turn on the lights? It's not so hard to read those names. Oh, I got another Doug Stone. He's, he's stuffing the ballot box. <laughs> what is that about? Uh, Tony Grimes? All right. Let's see. Marge Oliver? All right. You're on a roll now. Yeah. Did much better. Okay, Al Mercer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. Four for four. All 
All right, and Karen Vitali. All right. You can stand in the middle of them and get your picture taken four or five times. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Karen. Thanks. Y'all bunch up. <laughs> Jerry, you want to do New Year's next? Okay. <laughs> oh, you got to come up here and do it. You got, we all got pictures? Yeah. Okay, congratulations. You're all right. Uh, Jerry's going to draw a name out of the or a number out of the little hat, or maybe have you draw it. Here he comes. Thank you for coming up, folks. Maybe you'll we're going to do one more drawing for the replica medal, so we can put the names back in and uh, give everybody another chance and shake it up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so all right, should I draw? Who can do a drum roll for us? All right. Okay. Jim Weimers. Jim is online, I bet, but uh, Jim, you should have been here. <laughs> All right. Linda Davier. I bet she's watching. They just came back from Florida. The suspense is building. Chris Haller. I think he's a friend of uh, Justin Z's. Ah. Angie Haller. <laughs> All right. And at one of our meetings, we had like zero. five in a row in the front row. Caroline Miller. Nope. Make this up a little better, huh? What did I just say? From one meeting, we had a bunch of people in the front <laughs> row. Come on down, Kathy. Me? <laughs> All right. You can hold it. All right. Great. However you want. Uh, now maybe over there for the camera first. Okay. Is that right? Is in there? Mm -hmm. Got it? Yeah, let me give it. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. So I get to do one more thing. No, 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 no. Oh. <laughs> uh, oh, there's the box. I don't recall when I first heard about this book and, you know, this guy and I read about him and, you know, we started writing and uh, getting into it and I contacted you and I found you and, <laughs> et cetera, right. and you said, yeah, I could do something like that in a couple months. And I went, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a tradition in the World's Fair Society of giving first time presenters a yep. paperweight yep. with the yep. 1904 World's oh, Fair Society. Great. I love it. Hey. All right. Thank you. Pose for a picture. There you go. Oh, yeah. Here. Uh, there you well, go. And I guess we have. There you go. And I like that. And then we'll swivel left a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any more? Zoom in. <laughs> Mike L is practiced at smiling. <laughs> he does it very we well. Thank so, you. Thank you so, so much oh, for coming. I mean, thank you. Everybody.
next slide. I've learned a lot. I wish I could have learned a little bit more of those uh, teasers. <laughs> Who was it that read all the book? I only got about halfway through it and ran out of time. Yeah. Well, so uh, I'll be working on it. Enjoy the rest of it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks for coming out, everybody. Thanks, Mike. And for those of you who are hungry, if anybody is interested, uh, we're thinking of going to Biggie's, which is about four blocks or so to the west on Watson. Uh, the food ordering is open until 10 o'clock. Uh, the bar is open till midnight, but I'm not staying that late. So, uh, I haven't had dinner yet, and uh, it sounds like a good place. They got sandwiches, pizzas, pasta.